it be great again. Welcome back to the JT Show, Super Talk Mississippi. And joining us in studio, Senator Joey Fillingain. How are you today, sir? I am great, Dave. Thanks so much for having us today. Anytime. You know you are welcome. Anytime you want to walk up and turn the <laughs> knob on the door, my friend. Anytime. <laughs> Thank you. Um, hey, I haven't gotten a chance to talk to you in a while. I know. Actually. We've been flying under the radar a little. That's the last thing you've been doing <laughs> over there on the hill. Come on. Uh, the, the last term anybody would use is flying under the radar. You Probably have not. been the radar for like a month and a half, <laughs> uh, and it's going to continue for a while. Yes, it is. Um, I think currently we're scheduled to work through what we traditionally call you know, the last weekend, conference weekend, which would be this weekend. So we'd work all this week through the weekend and wrap up at some point towards the mid to end part of next week. Well, and I know there's been some discussion uh, about trying to – to kick it up a notch in terms of, mm-hmm. of how fast you proceed through what you have left to do. The budget, for example, I, th- I think you guys are kind of lumping some things together uh, in the first stage just to kind of push some stuff through, right? Absolutely. And I think everyone I've spoken with is totally in favor of that. Um, we are on a deadline schedule. So tomorrow is the deadline to get all of your general bills off of the House and Senate floor. So I know we worked a good bit this morning, then broke for a committee meeting going back in at one thirty. I, I haven't paid attention to what's going on the other end, but I'm assuming they're doing much the same and so that we can at least by tomorrow have all of the general bills cleared off of the calendar and either passed on to the governor or sent to conference so the conferees can be appointed and, and worked. And at the same time, you know, we had a finance committee meeting. I know the appropriations committees have been meeting. So I, I really do think there's an effort, you know, to get everything expedited as much as possible still you know, tending to the business, but getting us all completed and out the door so we can get back to our other lives. Well, and and that's one of the reasons. There are several different reasons. One of them is, you know, the legislature is a part-time job. Absolutely. At least it's supposed to be. Yeah, well, yeah, that's a pretty good point, (laughs) Joey. Uh, But but you guys, uh, most everybody has an actual job that they work. Sure. You you take time away from that to do this. Right. And, I mean, it's a public service, and we all ran for it. So, I mean, nobody's a martyr here. But at the same time, we did sign up with the understanding we'd be there essentially 125 days uh, this year, which would have been in, ended typically sometime at the end of April or 1st of May. And of course, because of the coronavirus situation that's affected all of us, um, we took some time off and had to come back. So um, hopefully, though, we will wrap up the most portion, uh, the, the meat of the session, at least by the end of next week, and then only have to come back in the event that the federal government passes additional stimulus or that we see that some of the other programs like the Back to Business Grant program that just launched last week needs to be plussed up with some additional CARES Act funds. So I think we're going to reserve maybe in that resolution about six days that we could be called back um, later into the fall. Well, and the good thing about it versus the original proposal that floated around, which was you guys could just come back every month for the rest of your lives, uh, <laughs> is what it sounded like to me. It's anyway. what it sounded like to us, too, and it was not uh, well received in many parts of the Capitol. So I think that's why you now have a much more concise, um, more fettered type well, resolution. It's, it's very targeted. Very. You, you come back for a specific amount of time in a specific month for a specific reason if it's necessary. And that's it. It's not a blank check. Right. Exactly. It's not so. an ending. So that's, that's very good. And, and from my understanding, I think you guys have enough days left in the regular session right. uh, to where that won't be an extra expense no. if you do come back. That is October. correct. Um, we're reserving, I think, six days. Um, so the most we could be called back into later in the year would be, like you said, in those very specific circumstances of if we need to plus up some funds um, from the current CARES Act money that was sent to the state or if new monies become available from the federal government. Those are really the only two reasons that we could be called back for a maximum of six days. And again, that was already factored into the original legislative expense budget. So it really ought not to cost the taxpayers an additional dollars. And that's the second reason to expedite this and get it out so that you can save those days. Oh, absolutely. We need to do that. Sure. So it's get you guys back home. Sure. It's it save those days in case we need them for later. And then there's the, 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 the ticking bomb off in the distance. Sure. Uh, we got the notification late yesterday that there's a staffer at the Capitol mm-hmm. that has tested positive for COVID-19. Sure, which is not surprising. I mean, this is a very large operation. You have not only 
the uh, 52 senators and 122 House members. You have all the affiliated staff and, you know, assistants and porters and, you know, all the visitors that come and go, which we've tried to limit that as much as possible. But, of course, it is a public building, and um, we do work for the taxpayers. So you obviously have to allow for access to your state capitol. So it's not like we can just shut down entry to the public's building. So it's sort of a fine line. We want to protect the, the visitors, we want to protect the staff, or protect ourselves. At the same time, we have to be transparent, and that's why you have you know video streaming and uh, those types of things as well for people to peer into what's going on both on the floor and the committee meetings so that you can see what your um, tax dollars are paying for. Now, you mentioned the Back to Business Grants yes. program earlier. That, that's up and running. Applications being taken, and I think we're up in the thousands. Oh, we are in the thousands. I think there was uh, over 5,000 um, grant applications received in the first couple of days even, you know, maybe three days, because I think it started like on a Wednesday. So I'm having quite a few people in my districts reach out to me asking about it. You just go to the MDA website, and there's a uh, electronic portal where you uh, key in your information, there's some documents that have to be, you know, attached to prove, you know, that all these things you're claiming actually do exist. These dollar amounts aren't just, you know, pie in the sky, but actually have a basis in fact. But um, I- I'm very excited. This $300 million overall that we expended, I think, 240 for the Back to Business grant. And then there are monies left over. So in the event that we have an overwhelming response and there aren't enough dollars in the original tranche of $240 million, there are additional monies that could be drawn from the CARES Act uh, original grant of the $1.25 billion that we could draw upon as well. Well, and this has been covered before, but I just again, I want to hit it again. Mm-hmm. Uh, th- this is a grant. This is not a loan. They right. don't pay it back. No, no, no. This is a total grant up to $25,000, and it really is targeted, which I think is good, for people who did not originally qualify for any federal funds, the PPP program. So you have your sole proprietors. You have, think of your barbers, your cosmetologists, your folks out there doing the yard work and things of that nature that they didn't have a huge payroll, so the payroll protection plan didn't really apply of them, but they nonetheless had expenses. They had rent or they had interest on loans. They had electrical expenses, you know, for utilities and things of that nature. So I think it was wise that we said for the first three weeks of the program, which we're still in the middle of, if you got a PPP loan slash grant from the federal government, you can't apply for the first three weeks. Of course, after the first three weeks is, is up, you will still be able to apply because, you know, just because you got a PPP program grant that was largely for payroll expenses so that certainly that helped your employees it may not really have helped the actual business owner with his or her expenses that much and of course this is completely separate from the two thousand dollar that is that was sent out there was a direct payment of two thousand dollars for certain um, irs type codes uh, for certain folks that we knew didn't get um, the payroll protection program monies and for instance, your cosmetologists, your barbers, your uh, people like that, that were out there, you know, suffering because we, the government literally said you cannot stay open for business. So it was through no fault of the business owners, um, you know, laziness or incompetence or anything. They were ready and willing to work, and we, the government, told them you can't open your doors. So I think the direct two thousand dollar payment to each of them, um, hopefully, has been received. If you have not received that yet, you need to contact, um, you know, the Department of Revenue and let them know that, hey, I file taxes as, you know, one of these designated uh, tax codes, and I haven't received my $2,000, and they can tell you why and try to figure that out for you. Yeah, and in some cases, you're not going to get it. In some cases, you are. It just depends on the the business type and and the situation. And if you've been paying taxes. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of people out there that, you know, may operate on more of a cash basis only, and um, obviously the state hasn't received any tax dollars um, you know, in, in those cases. And so, therefore, you're probably not going to get one of these grants sent out to you from the state. Well, and that's part of the difficulty. And we, we talk about this. We've talked about it before. You've got a lot of folks that do operate on a cash basis, and they're not up to anything nefarious, Mm-mm. but, you know, musicians that play at clubs right. uh, that are they're still trying to, to get things going again and start getting booked and getting some income coming in, mm-hmm. they don't have the tax, you know, uh, the receipts to show and say, hey, I made this much last year because I got paid in cash. Mm-hmm. But it, as a result, it's really hard to track those people down and, and do anything. And as Rhino said when we were talking about it a few weeks ago, well, you're not paying taxes. 
well, you're not, you're not, you're not there for the, the, the help when it comes up. Right. You have to pay in in order to get something back. Yeah, exactly. See, that's why you're the senator. You put it so much better than I did. <laughs> senator Joy Fillingame, we continue with him next on the JT Show. Super back. Senator Joey Fillingain in studio with us here on the JT Show. Dave Hughes here uh, from the C Spire text line. Are they going to make daylight savings time permanent in Mississippi? I'm pretty sure those all died for this session, didn't they? Those bills have now uh, died, yes. So not this year Not this the year. answer. Mm-mm. Uh, still could happen. They just did it in Louisiana. That's right. Governor John Bell Edwards signed it this week. Uh, but it doesn't go into effect until Congress Well, Washington. sure, it's sort of um, aspirational in nature, but, you know, we do a lot of things that are that way. Yeah, well, it's, uh, that's a good reason to get up in the morning some days, <laughs> exactly. Joey. Uh, now, now, let's talk about some of the things. Uh, just, boy, I cannot believe I'm going to phrase this this way. Uh, quickly, let's discuss the budget. Oh, good, yeah. Quickly doesn't go with that term this quickly year. Quickly doesn't. I mean, that is typically the last thing we do in the session, that along with the, the bond bill, um, which goes through the Ways and Means in the House and the Finance and the Senate. But um, the good news is we had a budget hearing yesterday, and the state economist, Dr. Darren Webb, came and sort of gave us the latest and greatest news, both nationally and as it relates to Mississippi. And, of course, the news is still not fantastic. Of course, we've been in a recession for the last two months, a very steep recession, I think probably the steepest uh, on record and the shortest, thankfully. So we have now um, come out of the recession as of May. And so we're, I guess, in the second month of the recovery And um, because of that, some of the original scary predictions have now been muted a little bit. So I think the latest figures, and I took some notes yesterday from the hearing, um, I believe the Legislative Budget Office is predicting that we'll be down somewhere in the area of $107 million. But, you know, out of a $5 to $6 billion budget, I mean, it's significant, but it's not, you know, four or five hundred million. Well, and, you know, just as recently as a week or two ago, we were hearing it could be five hundred million, eight hundred million. Yes, yes, yes. You know, it it could be a significant percentage of the budget. Right. So we'll take a hundred million. We'll take a hundred million. And knowing that there's five hundred million in the rainy day fund, of course, we've got a very active they tell us hurricane season upon us. We've already had, you know, Cristobal and there are others apparently that will be forming. But we don't want to just completely drain that fund down, obviously. But, you know, when you have a $500 million rainy day fund, there's a reason for that fund. And, and part of that is for large budget shortfall. So the governor has some authority to take, I think, up to $50 million out of that to shore up budgets. Next year, the predictions are a little worse. Um, they're still saying around $164 million down next year, but as compared to $800 million projections a month ago, that has really changed. And of course, you saw the retail sales reports nationally that the president was tweeting about early this morning, um, 17, I think, 0.7 percent yeah. growth. Um, and they were only expecting maybe 7%. So it was a huge number. Uh, the unemployment numbers a week ago were very robust, uh, coming back in more of that V-shaped recovery the president was talking about. So I'm very optimistic. I see the glass is half full in this situation. That doesn't mean there won't be some, you know, tightening of the belts in some of our agencies and probably most of our agencies. But I do think maybe we have escaped the 10 to 15 percent, you know, worst case scenario cuts that have been rumored at one point earlier in this cycle. Well, and you are very much a glass half full kind of guy. Oh, absolutely. We live in the greatest country in the world. And probably I would venture to say the greatest state in that country. So I'm very optimistic about our future. To the people that need to renew their driver's license, how's the glass look to you? Okay, so we have a bill um, on that that we just took up earlier in the week. It's going to conference. Chairman Busby on the House end, my good friend, and I have been working on this. And, of course, we have a fantastic new commissioner uh, appointed just a few weeks ago in Sean Tindall, who I've had meetings with, had lunch with last week. I'm very excited. Now, that does not mean that, you know, the offices weren't closed for 10 weeks. And anytime you shut something down for 10 weeks and then you reopen the doors, there are going to be, you know, horrendous lines and congestion, those sorts of things. So I've gotten uh, the emails, the phone calls, the pictures um, on my text messages from my constituents to prove that. And what I would tell them is that we understand, we see your pain, we know it's hot out there in the middle of June trying to stand outside in a very snake-like line out the door. So we hear you, we get it. 
Uh, part of that is um, systemic, and we're working on that in this bill. 1371 is the House Bill, 2633 is the Senate Bill. And essentially what we're saying in both of those versions is that we need to be more customer friendly. You know, the client is always correct, and we as the state always have to be very professional even when the situation may be tense, you have to um, treat the customer as you would want to be treated. So to that end, um, this bill contains language about things like if you have to wait more than you know, so many hours, then there's a discount on the cost of the license. There has to be um, you know, postings put up very visible inside um, the buildings and online to where if you need to go to the driver's license bureau for a specific reason to renew a license or get a CDL or you know any of the number of things you can do there, you ought to be able to look ahead of time and say, these are the documents that I'm going to, to need in order to accomplish this mission to get whatever it is I'm trying to get done. Because so often what happens is people show up thinking they can just get it with a driver's license and um, you know, maybe one form of ID or something, and they find out, oh, you've got to have a birth certificate, or oh, you've got to have a social security card, or so then they wait for two and a half, three hours in line, only to be told at the end of that wait, oh, well, you don't have the right documentation, try again tomorrow. And that really infuriates people, rightly so. So we want to make sure people know ahead of time before they ever step foot inside the driver's license station that these are the documents I'm required to have in order to gain access to this particular document or license or CDL. And so that when they get there and wait, hopefully not very long, um, that they can accomplish what they set out to do that day. Um, we also have language in there that says that uniformed highway patrolmen ought not to be you know, running the driver's license bureau. Uh, we have a shortage of highway patrolmen out on the streets to, to protect and serve, and we need those highly trained um, people to be out, not behind a desk, out on the streets providing services in that format. So we're asking through this legislation for Commissioner Tyndall, and he's in agreement with it, I've spoken with them to make sure that more customer service oriented type folks are trained for that specific role and allow our men and women of the highway patrol and the uniforms to be out providing roadside assistance and doing those types of things. I know it's the wrong year to ask this because mm -hmm. of what we've been going through. Sure. Uh, raising the staffing levels would probably help some, I would think. Yes, and I can tell you that in discussions with our legislative leaders that that certainly had been a very top priority. Um, and, of course, and then we, we run into COVID-19, which has slashed budgets left and right. So I'm not giving up hope that we can't maybe um, increase some of the staffing levels in these different uh, driver's license bureaus. And, and the other part, to be quite honest with you, is raising the pay of those individuals who work there. Um, because you typically get what you pay for. And so if you're paying, you know, essentially very, very low wages, then you can expect in many instances to get not the cream of the crop. So we need to make sure that we're paying those men and women who work behind those uh, desks at the driver's license stations a reasonable amount of money so that we can expect a reasonable uh, type of service and professionalism from all of our staff there. Well, and Commissioner Tyndall, Sean, uh, you know, just getting his feet wet. Great guy. Uh, has he been confirmed yet? Have they? Have well, we those confirmed two positions... him out. Of, we voted to confirm him out of the committee, Judiciary B Committee, um, earlier last week. And so his nomination is sitting on the calendar, and it will be taken up very shortly. He has overwhelming support. Um, he's a great guy and a wonderful selection the governor has, has picked to head this agency. And, of course, uh, same thing with Burl Kane, the, uh, the new— uh, He was just voted on this morning out of the, um, the committee, the Corrections Committee, and received unanimous vote from the committee members. So I think yet another excellent appointment from the governor. Fantastic. Uh, one one uh, thing that I want to get to before we run out of time. Sure. Uh, the the Life Equality Act. What is that and why is it important? Okay, so this is a great pro-life bill that um, uh, was filed by Representative Carolyn Crawford in the House and that is now over in the Senate. It essentially takes all of the protections against discrimination, be it sex discrimination, racial discrimination, or discrimination based on disability, and applies that inside the womb. So essentially this bill would require, before an abortion is performed in the state of Mississippi, that the physician 
asks the um, the expectant mother, now is the reason we're doing this abortion day because of the child's sex, the child's gender, or because of some chromosomal um, defect or anomaly um, that you believe this child may have? And if the answer to any of those questions is yes, then this legislation would say there would be no abortion. Now, obviously, Roe v. Wade says what it says, so there are certain limits to what we can uh, curtail on the abortion front. But I think we could all agree, certainly, um, in this time of, of heightened awareness in our society about discrimination, racial and otherwise, that we ought to protect the unborn child inside the womb, just like we protect um, citizens outside the, the womb from discrimination based on uh, sex, race, or you know, disability. So it's sort of the wokeness in the womb bill this year. <laughs> did you come up with that name? I think I did, yes. Okay, okay. I just wanted to give credit where it was due, because that's pretty good. Senator Joey Fillingame, we appreciate it, man. It's always a pleasure to be here. Thank you, you for what you do. Come over here more often. And I'm glad to hear that JT is doing better. He's from back in my part of the world in Covington County originally, so we pray for him and wish him the very best. Thank you so much, Joey. Appreciate Thank you, Dave. It. Senator Joey Fillingame, we continue with a chance to win and just a